The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. And yes, the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> we were off last week, uh, partially for the 4th of July and partially because I've been under the weather. Um, but uh, back, we're back. We're thrilled to be here with you guys. We're live today. This is Wednesday. I, n I never know what the date is. It's July something. Tenth. The 10th. Yeah. And you, the voice that you just heard is Evelyn Kung because uh, it's Wednesday and you know that sometimes we have asked Dr. Doreen and now sometimes throughout the summer we're having Ask Evelyn Kung and we're thrilled that she's here. In just a few minutes she's going to be answering your questions live. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how you can participate in that because this whole show is meant to be interactive. We really love it when you participate with us. So let me remind you that there are many different ways that you can do this and our fabulous trade is going to show you some of the different ways that you can connect with us. While he does that, I want to remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. When you go there, lots of different things you can do. Check out all the videos that we have, but you can chat with us by clicking on the chat button that's at the bottom of the page now. When you click on that, it opens up and then there's a box that you can put your information in there and just hit enter. It shows up here on my screen almost in real time. There is a bit of a lag, so I do encourage you to ask your questions early and often, uh, just like they used to joke about voting early and often, uh, right? And um, that's just one of the ways that you can connect with us. I will tell you that that is the completely anonymous way. Even I don't have information about who you are or where you are in the world. So it becomes important when you send in a question to let us know where the closest major city is so that we can help you if you're asking for resources to tell you what might be in your neck of the woods. But other than that, you can be completely anonymous. Now, when you answer questions on Facebook and YouTube, it's a little less anonymous, right? Because people can trace back who asked the question, but we love to get questions in whatever way is convenient for you to send them. Um, and it is completely free, as I mentioned. I think that's a really important and wonderful thing that we're able to do here. By the way, uh, when you are on our page, autism-live.com, there will be a pop-up about six or seven seconds after you're on the page that will ask you, do you want to, uh, excuse me, to subscribe? And all that is, if you sign up for that, you will get our weekly, um, it's a viewer guide. It's, we call it the postcard that we send out to you to let you know who's going to be on the show that week. I think it's a really wonderful resource and we don't give your information to anybody else. The only other time that we use that list is if there's something urgent. Sometimes we get very little notice when we're going to have a big guest, like, for instance, Dr. Temple Grandin on the show live. Sometimes that is outside the parameters of when we are normally on and we love to shoot our subscribers a message saying, hey, we're looking for questions for Dr. Grandin or tune in at this time because we will be there with her. We really don't take advantage of uh, your information at all. We won't. I'm, I'm a big fan of not giving people too much information, right? Because then, I, I don't know about you, but I start to ignore it after that. So please, uh, if it suits you, subscribe, and that way that pop-up will go away. Otherwise, it will come every time you log in, and then you can just click the little X box. In any case, I mentioned that uh, our special guest today, we're, we're doing our segment, Ask Evelyn Kung. Evelyn Kung is here with us. And Evelyn, give them a little bit of background about how long you've been in this field and how long you've been at CARD and what you do at CARD. I have been here since before there were any offices. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much the beginning, almost Pretty, the beginning. Almost the beginning. Um, fell into this, really. Didn't plan on this. Uh, picked off, you know, pre-internet. 
when they had the posters with the little cutout bottoms. Ah. I picked out a little, and it ended up being in Ibar Lovas' lab. Wow. And it was just a coincidence. I had no idea who he was. I wasn't a psych major. I had no clue. Wow. <laughs> but it was before, it was right at the beginning of the surge of autism, probably. Yeah. And um, so there was no such thing as ABA, the study that showed that, you know, early interven intensive intervention could make a difference had just come out. Yeah. And, uh, and Dr. Gramsci had just finished her PhD wow. through that time, and she had, had gone out and started on her own. And when I left UCLA, they said, hey, there's this person that just started her own clinic. Why don't you call her? She'll probably hire you. Wow. And so it's been 25, almost 30 years. And the rest is history, the rest as is they history. say. Didn't know how long I was going to stay in this field, but I really loved it, and I loved the kids. And I, I always tell Shannon, I love all the problem solving involved in it. Isn't that and a wonderful thing? I love the variety in yeah. the spectrum. Yeah. The variety is in all the kids and their personalities and you know strengths and weaknesses is just something that I really love. Every day is different, right? Yeah, every day is different. I still enjoy seeing kids. Nowadays I spend half my time helping supervisors here at CARD problem solve. Yeah. So when there are issues that come up with kids or maybe we have a kid who's doing really well and they want to make sure he's staying on track, um, I will drop in and do some supervision on the case, make sure things are going the way they should be, or help try to problem solve mm -hmm. if we run into a situation where a kid stops learning or there's a behavior that just you know won't go away. Yeah. Uh, trying to figure that out. And then the other half of my time is working on technology now. And so it's, it's working on the skills curriculum, which is a skills website, which um, there's, uh, Shannon will tell you more about that later. <laughs> but yeah, it's basically what CARD uses as a curriculum and we have um, for those internal at CARD, we also do all our data through an iPad. So Which it's building amazing. the logbook that is all, you know, connected to the skills website. So, you know, when a child, when the child and the therapist are working out there, every mark is recorded and immediately loaded into the child's protocol um, program and on the website. And you can see everything the child's doing. Which and is amazing. So it's really fun for me. It's the variety and the problem solving, I'd say. And great for all of us, and wonderful that you are willing to take this time to answer questions for folks that are out there uh, wanting answers. Uh, so I, I'm going to start with a question that we can maybe both answer together. Uh, we had a question a couple of weeks ago, and the person says, thanks for answering my question. Oh, I didn't give the disclaimer first. I okay. need to give the disclaimer. I'm getting ahead of myself. That uh, there is no expert in this format that could give individual specific advice. So keep in mind that that is not what Evelyn will be doing. Um, she won't be giving individual specific advice. There's no way she could have enough information in this format for it to be you know, something that could be individual specific. It would be a disservice to say otherwise. Definitely. But um, you can send in your questions and Evelyn will give us her thoughts from her many, many, many years of experience. And sometimes it raises more questions that you can go back and ask, but it's not individual specific. Okay. So having said that, thanks for answering my question a few weeks ago about what to look for when coming off of a GFCF diet. Do you remember when we had that yeah. question a couple of weeks ago? I definitely see an increase in behaviors and he's had a few headaches oh. since taking him off. I didn't do it drastically, just little by little. Shannon, you talked about doing challenges with your son. Where can I read more about that or can you tell me what you do with him? Thank you. Um, and so, I'll, I'll, and then I'll say a little bit about for my part of it and then if you wanna jump mm -hmm. in. Uh, years ago, when I was in my 20s and allergic to everything, I was like a series of hives walking around. And um, there was a, a doctor, Dr. Stuart Berger, who came out with a book. And um, then he became sort of the talk show circuit doctor. He, it was back in the beginning of all, because that would have been, oh my goodness, in the, <laughs> in the 80s, all right? Uh, when I was in my 20s. And I was just finished with undergrad and moving to New York City. And I, I was concerned because I just was constantly in a state of hives and it's hard yeah. to concentrate yeah. and whatever. So he had this book that was called The 21 Day Elimination Diet, right? And it was when people were really starting to talk about food allergies and it was before you could go and get a blood test to see what you were allergic to. There was all the little scratch tests, but there was no blood test for allergies. So there was a 21 day diet that you went on that had the, the, the seven things that you're most likely to be allergic to were eliminated completely for 21 days. And then over the course of 
the next 21 days, every three days, you would try one of the things that was on that list of seven, and you would have it three times during the day um, and note any response to it. And this is a pretty common practice mm -hmm. for um, allergies. Yeah. It's pretty out there. Um, you know, basic doctors will recommend this. Uh, it's a little less often used now because now usually people go, they get a blood test. The blood test comes back and says, you're allergic to this. You're about to be allergic to this. You might be having a reaction to this. It's really very high tech now. So a lot of people don't bother with an elimination diet anymore. Um, but this is what I come from, the experience. And what, it was life changing for me when I was in my 20s. I eliminated those seven things and felt so differently at the end of 21 wow. days that I was unrecognizable wow. um, to myself and to other people. And then, I, and then I did the challenges, what they call the challenges, which is where you three times during the day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you have a serving of whatever it is that you think you're allergic to. And I was a mess on almost all seven things, oh, right? So hard. And, and that's when I first began to realize, oh, I am, I am allergic to these things that I did not know before. So that's what we did with my son, except that he had gluten and dairy out of his diet for a decade. And oh, especially over this last um, Christmas holiday, we set up a challenge and he wanted to try dairy, so we went and bought a bunch of little samples of cheese, you know, of different varieties and flavors of things, and so three times during the day, he got to have a serving of cheese, and he was so excited, and oh my gosh, my, I always say my child is epicurious. He <laughs> wants to taste everything and go, that's what that tastes like. So he had the cheese and was tasting, oh, that's what Havarti is. And oh, that's what Swiss cheese tastes like. And he was like, what's the point of Swiss? Uh, <laughs> which was interesting. But good. Havarti, he loved, loved Havarti. And he liked sharp cheddar too. But by the next, and I was going to let him do it for two days, which is a little bit different than Dr. Berger's 21 diet thing, um, to see, to be sure, because I thought it was going to take longer than a day for him to see a difference. But by the, that night, he was doubled over in pain Ugh. and saying, I don't ever want to have cheese again. And so he got to make the choice that he was not going to have it the second day. So that's what I meant by a challenge. Um, and, you know, you can look up uh, allergy elimination diet um, and it'll tell you basically a 21 day diet and then you have to give the body time to heal. You can't just eliminate it for three days. You have to give the body time to heal, then reintroduce it and you can't reintroduce it in a very small way because sometimes if you have just a little, it's just enough that it throws you off, but you're so busy with other things that you don't notice right. and you don't connect it. So that's why, you know, you were saying you didn't do it drastically and, and I, and I get that, but sometimes you need to have a, a little bit more than that so that you can go, Oh, that is in fact what's causing the hives or that is what's causing the cramps because otherwise everything just becomes a wash. It's a pain in the neck um, when you're allergic to things. Or, and, I, and it isn't just allergies. Sometimes you have other reactions to things that it, it wouldn't show up on an allergy test. You have a sensitivity or I don't know. And I will say this too, that all of the friends that I, that I have that have food allergies notice that it's like, um, uh, you know, if you start off and the day is good and there's no allergens in the, the system, then maybe you could have a little bit more before you get to reaction. But there, there is a thing where the tank gets full and then there's overfull. Yeah. So at times of the year when things are flowering, I really can't risk having something that I'm allergic to because my body is already fighting all those other things and it yeah. doesn't have the ability to fight. Uh, and I see that in my son and I, like I said, I've seen that in all my friends who have food allergies it is, or, or food sensitivities. So um, it's a tough road. Anything you want to add? You know, one of the things that a doctor told me a while ago, and I don't know if technology has changed since then, but a lot of times when you ask for a blood test for little kids, mm -hmm. the doctors don't want to give it. 
Mm. And the reason they don't want to give it is supposedly the child's immune system is unstable. Mm. So one day you can test not allergic, and the next day you can. It goes your immune wow. system goes up and down. So that's why, like, if you just for a lot of t uh, even now, doctors don't seem to with the families that I work with mm -hmm. don't seem to go to the blood test early, and I think it's because of that. And they say until the immune system stabilizes, usually around they said eight to ten years old then that there's more of a consistent, like if you're allergic to something, you're consistently allergic versus wow. one day you can show one effect and another day you can show another effect when you're little. Yeah. So it's something that, you know, we've had families go and actually get tested and mm -hmm. come back and say there's no allergy, but then the kid eats something and breaks out in hives. Yeah. And it's just like, what is this about? Because the allergy test said no yesterday. Yes. But today, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, I mean, that is something really to talk to your physician about about how to do it, what to do. And I know the families that end up doing um, the elimination diets, they do it because it's a little bit more consistent. At least they've seen that response and they don't want that response again. Yeah. And then that's it, that actually tells them more. Yeah. Um, it's a, and it's hard. It's a hard, hard road to go and it's hard to alter diets. If you live near a major city, it's a little bit easier now, but you know, if you live far out and it's hard to get things that um, just special types of, you know, all the different types of grains that aren't gluten-free and everything yeah. else. Now the internet helps a lot, but really, overall, it is a commitment by the family. It's not yeah. even just for the kid, it's for the whole family to really commit to. I am I'm, I'm having to change my diet a little bit right now that I can't have any salt. There is no salt allowed. I'm not even allowed, supposed to sit next to a salt shaker, right? And it is, I've gotten a little bit spoiled living in Los Angeles, and I've been reminded in the last week about how I can remember a time when my husband and I were crossing the desert and we'd stopped, and I was a vegetarian for many years, and we stopped someplace to eat, and there was, n there was no vegetable in the town. Yeah. I'm not kidding. No, I, there was no I've vegetable <laughs> in the town. And I was like, no, somebody's got to have a leaf of lettuce, or you got to have a can of green beans. Like, I'm not even being fussy here. Are you kidding me? There was no vegetable in the town. And, you know, so what do you do when that happens? But um, I, I'm seeing that, uh, again, being retreated, because I called, we had to go to a restaurant a couple of days ago, and I called ahead of time, and I said, I'm going to be looking to have a vegetable dish with no salt. And they just were like, no. No. In Los Angeles. And I said, no, 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 no. I know you can do it. And, and the guy said to me on the phone, if I do it with no salt, it'll have no flavor. And I was like... I, I'm aware of that, just to get, <laughs> but I'm saying that's what I need to have for medical reasons, and um, it's just fascinating how how hard it can be, especially if you're trying to go out. Yes. Um, so if you're going to do an elimination diet and do a challenge, I would look at your calendar, and and wow. see like what do I have coming up, that and and if you have to for your child to do that, bring food with you. Um, like, you know, seriously pack food whenever you're going someplace, even if you're in a restaurant, uh, you know, um, but it is doable and it sounds like you'd already really done the hard work of the elimination diet. It's just now that you're doing the introductions, um, it's so hard because we don't want to believe that it's tied to the challenging behavior. Yeah, and, and the thing is you're saying that you see an increase in behaviors and there's headaches. That, that is how our kids manifest it. We've yeah. had so many kids where they don't do the traditional hives and runny nose and eyes yeah. and all that. They're hand flapping, you yeah. know, when the, the winds blow or, you know, you give them a strawberry and their ears turn red. Oh, that yeah. was my favorite one for one of my kids. Yeah. He's allergic to strawberries, but he loves strawberries. Yeah. And he would sneak it. Yeah. And I'd open the door and he would be giggling and his ears would be bright red. Right. And it was just like, oh, you got into the strawberries today. And who, what parent thinks that, you know, strawberries could be bad for a kid? Right. You know, you want to give it to them because it's like it's healthy, it's right. nutritious. But for him, you know, if she, they did that, the, eye, the ears would turn red and the hand flapping would start. Yeah. And that, if he was hand flapping, he couldn't do anything else. And that's the thing. That's the problem. I, that's really the thing that you want to think about. I... I my mom had such a hard time when we put my son on the gluten-free, casein-free diet. And by the way, my son, we uh, didn't have him on any sugar either. And very, uh, we tried to minimize the artificial colors. That was sort of the priority. And uh, my mother lived for ice cream. You know, it was a religion with her. And, <laughs> uh, and she 
had this excitement uh, that she was going to bond over getting an ice cream cone with my son. Well, you know, that's a gluten, dairy, sugar nightmare, <laughs> right? And um, so my mom really, really struggled with it. Wow. And finally, one day when she was visiting, she was emotional about it. I mean, food's emotional. It's love, right? And she was like, was he, you know, this poor little boy, is he never going to get to have ice cream? And I said, oh, mom, let's be clear about this. We could give him ice cream today. We absolutely could give him ice cream to, uh, today if that was the thing that was most important. But he probably won't be able to talk for two weeks after that. Yeah. And I said, is that really what you want for him? And she said, really? Is that what would happen? And I said, yeah, that is, in fact, what would happen. He probably um, would have a meltdown and he wouldn't be able to sit and play a board game with you, and he wouldn't be able... And she said, no, no, stop. We don't need to do ice cream. Because when she understood it that way, then it yeah. was different. Yeah. But other than that, it felt like ice cream was everything having to do with childhood and, and summer and, the, you know, all these happy, happy memories that she had, um, which, you know, was sad yeah. for her. But um, in any case, it's about the choices that we make. And often, you know, it's the, the, the red around the ear thing. And uh, you find yourself kind of negotiating with yourself and mm -hmm. going, well, red around the ear isn't that bad. But it really is just a signal that something else is going on. And you know how it is for you when you've got something else going on. If you, you know, your tummy is gurgling or you've got a headache and it's there in the back and you can still get something done, but it's not the day you would want to learn physics, right? Yeah. And that's really what our kids are trying to do on a daily basis is yep. learn physics. They're trying to learn how to communicate. They're trying to learn how to negotiate all these rules and social things that they don't know how to do. It's physics. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't want to do that on a day when your ears are hot and red. Yep. So. Exactly. All right. Well, let's leave that question for now then. Write us if you have more about that. Let's take a short break and then we're going to be back talking about uh, somebody asked, how much is ABA therapy out of pocket? So let's talk about wow. what that is. Yeah, that's a big question. Stick with us. Back with Evelyn Kung after these messages. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get wild, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Hi, welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman. Uh, we're here doing allergy-free cooking, and I brought my sister with me today. Jamie Davis, thanks yeah. for having me. A lot of people are asking about a allergy-free breakfast, and breakfast can be full of crap. You it, know, breakfast, but it's full of cereal. crap, and it's hard to do. We yeah. don't have time in the morning. We're in a hurry. We're going completely nut-free. The recipe is not Personality, really. we can't do yeah, anything can't about. Yeah, can't do anything about that. So we're going to start off first with... Um, I'm using sorghum and brown rice flour. It, I find the texture good, and I've added some flaxseed meal. We talked about that last time, flaxseed meal for poop. Almost every one of our kids has a poop issue. What's next on the recipe is the quinoa flakes, baking powder, cinnamon, and the xanthan gum. It brings the glutinous texture back into the flour, and often what happens with these recipes is they can fall apart. This one holds up nicely. I like it. For the folks that are egg free, we have a ton of egg replacers. One of those can be the arrowroot starch or bringing back some additional flax seeds. So there's a lot of options to go eggless, but we're gonna go egg full in this one. For sweetener, I use the maple syrup. I stay away from refined sugar. What I'm adding now is the coconut uh, milk, maple syrup, and a little bit of the coconut oil. And we're gonna add in the raisins craisins and chocolate chips at the end. I find that chocolate chips can coax people to eat some really amazing things. When we started, Jeff had 42 food allergies, so we had to get creative in how we cooked. So nuts were a big, big issue. What I like now is that he can tolerate so many more things after we start doing this diet. So let me show you how you can deal with this um, sticky stuff here. You get your fingers really wet, and you can push it down. So my oven has been preheated. It's at um, 350 degrees. So we're gonna just throw this in. Like I said, I like it around 23 minutes. And the magic oven says, I'm done. Looks like. Don't you love magic ovens? They're awesome. Here we go, pops right out. The texture of these, and it's so pretty. It looks almost like a big chocolate chip cookie, but you actually made it healthy. But you can be wow. my guinea pig. Tell me what you think. It looks really good. Doesn't it? So 
the textures and the colors in there are just beautiful. So the raisins are for you, the chocolate chips are for your kid. I can't believe it's gluten free. I know, right? It doesn't taste like, you know, crap. crap. <laughs> <laughs> We're wrapping up another cooking show. If you have feedback, you can email us at autismlive at gmail.com. We're of course on Facebook. You could go to facebook.com slash autism live. And of course, Taka Now has thousands of recipes. Join me there and we can um, cook some more later on. So thanks for joining us. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get right, let's get right. Let's get, let's get, let's get right. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're here with Evelyn Kung and she is answering your questions in real time. We wanna say hi to all the folks who've been saying hi on Facebook. Hi to Colorado. Hi everybody else. Um, and uh, there was something else I had on my agenda and I don't remember what it was. Uh, okay, so we left last and said that we were gonna answer the question or at least attempt to skirt around the, <laughs> the question uh, that somebody wrote in, how much is ABA therapy out of pocket? That's a loaded question. Right, well, yeah. and, and my answer is always more than anyone can afford. Yes. Um, I, I love years and years ago, Holly Robinson Pete wrote, a blog, the eight things that everyone should know about autism, and number one is no one can afford it yes. uh, on, the, on their own. And I always took that as, well, Holly is, you know, mm -hmm. somebody who probably has a little bit of money, and she knows Oprah, they're friends, she's friends with Oprah, so I assume if Holly says no one can afford it, then that means Oprah can't afford it, which means none of us can afford it. Um, so there's that, uh, but then it's a deeper question, the out-of-pocket, do you want to like <laughs> hazard a guess oh I don't even want to guess because if you are if this is 40 hours a week and you're doing anything four hours a week it's a month's salary yeah so just think about that and then you think about all of there's different levels of people yeah and um, I mean it's a business in itself yeah. before I mean I'm very thankful now that we have actually there is funding you know yes the majority of the states, you know, in the federal mandate to cover autism has really helped and opened the field up to people of every um, SES level. Yeah. And it's, it's an amazing thing because when I started doing this and ABA first came out, all the families I knew were all selling their houses yeah. so they could pay for ABA for their child. And it's not just ABA, it's all the doctors and if you have any biomedical issues, along with it yeah. and then if there's any food related then you're only buying certain kinds of food and I mean it just goes on and on and no one can really afford it yeah years and years ago um, I mean I think it was it's over 10 years ago that my son started ABA therapy uh, it was paid for by the regional center and we had 40 hours of ABA for a good portion of our first year of ABA. And the regional center sends you not a bill, but it's like a bill. And it shows you, here's what we paid for your kid. And I think the first year, and, and keep in mind, this is 10 years ago, uh, I think the first year was $140,000. And that was just, you know, for that first year. Uh, so keep that in mind. But I also want to say on the flip side of that, that we know people who have been able to implement, an a, with a great deal of work, yes. implement an ABA program in their home and get their child to the point where their child no longer qualifies for a diagnosis of autism, and they did it essentially for zero dollars. Um, because, and I'm thinking of, uh, there's the family, um, Maddie, that at the very beginning of Skills, when Skills was just coming out, yeah. one of the things that Dr. Grand Pichet did was that she gave Skills to the world for free for a year and said, use this in any way that you can, um, learn from this in any way that you can for a full year. And Maddie's family just happened to be one of the first families that signed up for it on day one. Mm -hmm. And they got together their church and their community and they trained everybody and that was back when skills had the component of it where you could teach people as well. Now that's separate. So there's Institute for Behavioral Training and Skills. Mm -hmm. But they had all access to all of that for free mm -hmm. and trained everyone. And they implemented a 40-hour program with their daughter, with volunteers, and got her to the point where she no longer qualified for a diagnosis of autism and, and you know, essentially zero dollars. Essentially zero dollars, a lot of people power. A lot of manpower, yes. yes. Sweat equity. Um, Definitely. There. 
And if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to do what they did, that's still available to you. As we said, it would be skills and IBT and you having to get together and train with using IBT, a group of volunteers. It wouldn't be entirely for free, but it would be so low cost. Yes. Uh, to do the full RBT training on IBT. RBT is the Registered Behavior Technician. And if you bought it for one person, you'd be able to do it for many more people because yeah. you have the videos. So you could train a team. I think that would it would be under $500 to do the whole training. And then you could have access to skills um, and skills for one child is, a, I believe it's, I believe it's around $70 a month, but I think that there is an autism live discount. So you should ask for the friends and family autism live discount for that. So it would be like $500 and around $70 a month and all of your time. Yeah. And this is what families do around the world right now. Yep. There are so many people who live far, far away in remote areas of the world and there is no other choice. They have people around them and they have the internet and yeah. basically they take the two together and they work really hard to teach their kids yeah. and it's a lot of work it's families parents have said it's like i had to build a business yeah and put it into place and be the employee for my own child That's and right. everybody working with them and you know families have told me the way they've gotten through it is they just in their mind they're like we just have to be in an emergency mode for a couple of years that's right if i can do this for a couple of years and my child there's a chance my child can come out of this and not show any signs and go on to live a uh, typical life then this is worth it yeah and that's what drives those families really to work that hard to put it it's worth all of it you know if at the end your kid comes out and everybody tells you it was all in your imagination <laughs> which is frustrating yeah. but amazing Yes, and, and I'm at that side of the mountain now where, and I look back and I go, I don't, I don't know how we did what we did. I know how much help we had, and I didn't have to be the project manager. I was so lucky that I lived at a card place, and even that was so overwhelming to me that I had a nervous breakdown. Yeah. You know, so please don't think that I'm saying that it's an easy thing to do, but I've, I managed to get through all that. And I've seen other families be the project manager for it and get through it. So I know it's possible. Yeah. Um, and, and really, I, I think one of the things that was said to me early on, and I really took it to heart, was somebody said, stop thinking about what it costs in terms of time and money, because that's time and money that you just spent on that. Just do it. Yeah. I, and I always go back to the analogy of the mountain that um, when you want to climb a mountain and you stand at the foot of the mountain and look up, it looks insurmountable. Um, but you have that idea of the peak in your head and you start walking up the mountain. And once you get on the mountain, you can no longer see the peak. You see the path in front of you. And you have to take it step by step. But you have to keep the idea of the peak in your mind. But it's more manageable once you're actually on the mountain. Definitely. So do that with autism and make up your mind that it doesn't matter how much it costs, that you're going to find a way to make it work that other people have and that you will too. Even now, I look back and I don't understand how, how the math worked. And it's okay. You know, it, it ultimately, worked it, it worked out. It, you did everything for your kid and it was worth it. So, and it paid off. And it paid off. And, you know, so many families, maybe they don't get the same result. Yeah. But families tell me, you know what, my kid's happy. Yeah. They have a way to communicate, yes. has things he enjoys, yep. you know, is an active part of a household. Yep. Not in the way that the family thought, but was going to be before they were born. Right. But now, I mean, as a 20, 30 something old adult, is a fully functioning member of their household and is a happy kid and ultimately yes. for every parent. That's you know, the thing. That's the thing. And I will say this, even though everybody has a different outcome and, um, and, and looking at those outcomes, you know, I mean, you know which one you want, yeah. but everybody has a different outcome. And of all the families that I know, of the ones who went all in, who did everything that they could, nobody has any regrets about that. Exactly. I have never heard a single parent who went all in for ABA say later on, you know what, I wish I had that time back. I would do something different. But what I do hear are the parents who did ABA, but they didn't do it all in, go, gosh, I don't think we ended up where we meant to. Yeah. And they have all this guilt and angst about, did we do enough? So I, I firmly tell you, for your, for your kid's sake and for your own gut lining, go all in yep. for a, a few years. Yep. 
think of it, I, I love Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, I always used to say, think of it like getting your kid ready for the Olympics. It's not the rest of your life, it's just this amount of time that you're going to devote, but you got to go all in, because you can't have any regrets. Yep. So there we go. All right. Um, I, okay. So uh, next question. Somebody wants to know what it's like being diagnosed with autism. I don't know if that's from an adult. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not, I mean, we, neither of us is on the spectrum, so we really can't know. But from all the kids I've worked with, I mean, what part of the spectrum, you know? I think there's so many levels of understanding of like, you know, what it's like that, you know, for us, it's just, I just, you know, I actually, I don't even look at people and their kids. I don't look at them as being on the spectrum. I just say, what's difficult for you and what's easy for you to learn? Yeah. And what do you really enjoy? And that really starting from there is yeah. the important part because what is difficult, okay, let's try to, you know, figure out what will make life easier for you. Right. And really addressing that. But at the same time, what do you really enjoy? Yeah. And being able to build on that, you know, what are you good at? You know, like, let's see if that can help some of the things that you can't do. But a lot of this is just making them as independent as they can be. Yeah. You know, it really is working towards, like, so that they can do things that they love in a way that they love in a manner that fits into the life of the family, too. You know, it really looks at that. But I think it's immensely difficult for some for so many of our kids when they start to realize that there is something going on. Yeah. And um, when they look at it in terms of strengths and weaknesses, it's always easier for them to understand. When our kids come in and maybe, like one of the kids I worked with, he was, IQ was over the top. Yeah. And after his first day, he came into CARD. He went home, he looked up autism right. <laughs> on the internet. Right. <laughs> came running down the stairs and told his parents, I do not have autism. <laughs> I do not have, you know, like all, you know, yes. you know and went through the DSM and right. said. And, but the thing is for him, it was so hard for him to just like, I have that, this means I have a disability. And, and he was going on and reading like, this is a lifelong disability. Right. And like, how can you say that? I like my life. Right. And it was just like, well, there's this whole other world that you don't know about right now. Yeah. And it was really hard for him, but just being able to, what do you mean there's another world? Like, you know, and if right. you're literal, there's not another world. Right. <laughs> so, but it was just like, he, it, it hurt for all the kids that we've worked with, the hardest is when they realize, wow, other people make friends a lot easier than I do. Mm. Yeah. And I think that that is when they get to the point where they realize that and they can observe something like that. Yeah. That is really, really hard for them. Yeah. And those are the kids where I'm like, yeah, it can be easy, but hey, you know what? We can teach you. Yes. You know, and maybe you won't want a thousand friends because you're not comfortable with a thousand friends. Right. But if you have those one or two and that's good for you, that's all that matters. Absolutely. We've had a lot of adults now on the show who have been diagnosed in their adult years. And the one thing that I'm always struck by that they all say is that, uh, and it was surprising to me the first few times I heard it, they say that it was like um, a peace that would come over them when they would be diagnosed because it was like meeting themselves for the first time. Mm -hmm. It was the big aha of, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm different in this way, which means I've been trying to... It's that whole thing about if you try to teach a fish to walk up a ladder yeah. <laughs> uh, and judge how they're doing based on that, that it's not a fair assessment of what they're doing. And so, you know, the, the phrase that they use is, I got to meet myself for the first time, and which is such a poignant phrase. Um and, and not something that's aversive at all. Um, but then this understanding and this awareness of, oh, I'm good at these things and these are things that are not in my arsenal, but I could choose to have them in my arsenal mm -hmm. if I felt that they were important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. There's something about that that's very exciting to me that, that that's the way it's taken. I think that's a positive. So anyway, but but... I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay, moving on to the next question. I work with special needs. I wish to further my skills for working with my clients. I took RBT online class and feel like I just really didn't get enough information. I really like the way your videos are explained. Do you offer a course or could you recommend one? And we try to, um, here on the show, uh, we obviously have the jargon of the day that we do um, twice a week, and we have a library of those on our YouTube channel. 
And I love going to an autism conference because we have uh, students who will come up to us, now BCBAs, who tell us that that's how they studied for their wow. test, was watching our um, jargon of the day, <laughs> which I, that makes me so happy. They use them in college classes now that they, uh, that, uh, I guess uh, there's one in particular that they really love uh, when I explain extinction first. <laughs> so that makes me so happy you just can't even imagine. And it's very humbling to me, but what that was meant for was for the parents uh, to be able to figure out what you people talk about. Um, but I will say that we love IBT, ibehavioraltraining.com. Um, it's where you can go any time of the day or night and you can pick and choose the topics that you want. You can do their RBT class online. And what I love about their RBT class and I don't know, you, uh, you were going to add something there. Yeah, I was going to say, see, RBT is Registered Behavior Technician. There is actually another, another certification called a BCAT, yeah. Board Certified Autism Technician. Yeah. And that one actually focuses more on autism. Right. And there are on the IBT website all the BCAT classes. And that actually is more focused on autism. Yeah. So if that is something that you're interested in, because I know that um, the RBT is give it set really f to learn behaviors yeah. not necessarily in the world of autism right they use a lot of examples and that is the greatest place of practice for an rbt but there is the whole autism side of things and yeah. learning how to work with somebody with autism that is very different yeah and, and, and what i love about um the eye behavioral trainings website is that they group um lessons by category, but you get to choose which category you want. So if you want to go in and learn as a parent, which means it's going to be less jargon, right, and more specific towards uh, what a parent would have to encounter, um, you can do that. If you are a parent and you're like, yeah, I've already been there and done that and I want to know because I want to ch uh, teach my child's teacher, you can go in and there's a whole um, section for educators, which are, tr you know, I love because other places it's like, well, you're an educator and you go in to do something and it's about what to do in a room when you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, which teachers don't get to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so IBT has a whole section that's just for the classroom, and then there's a whole section that's just for professionals, and you can pick and choose which topics you want. So if there's just one topic that you want to get really proficient in because that's what your kid is doing or what your client is doing, you can choose that topic and only pay for that module, and the modules are really low cost. And I know that people say that, and, and everybody's low cost is different, but... Um, they start at seven dollars and fifty cents, yep. and 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 as we were saying before, you can learn it yourself. Watch the video yourself. Have your significant other watch the video. Have your babysitter watch the video, and it's all under that same seven dollar and fifty cent price. Um, I think the most expensive one might be thirty five dollars. And when you think about, and that's a lengthy one. And when you think about, if you were going to go buy a book on these subjects you would spend at least that. When I went to go buy Jackie McCandless's Children of Starving <laughs> Brains, which is like a doorstop book, uh, I think I paid 80 bucks for that. Yeah. So, um, you know, really incredible uh, opportunity to learn more. And you could then become, uh, take the class to be the BCAT. Yep, you could be. And, and there's the two sides. Sometimes, actually, I've had people do the different versions, uh -huh. you know, parent, teachers. And it actually gives a little bit of a different perspective. Yeah. You know, and because it's coming from a different way. And there's a lot of people who really appreciate that. And understanding here, we have one concept, but from different viewpoints and saying, like, okay, this is really what it is. Yeah. And learning about it and being impl implement it. I mean, honestly, every child's different. So if you're trying yeah. to do an RBT class or one of these classes and trying to figure out your child, your child is so much more complex than that just one subject or that right. one behavior that it does, does take a lot more. I always tell families, you know, the best thing for me to do is to see a child. Because yeah. if I see them, then it's like, oh, okay, I can understand, you know, however, you know, how they're functioning in the world, how they're interacting with the world. But if you look at it from an outside perspective, people describe what they see. Yes. They may not describe the whole child, but yes. they're just describing what they see. And so that makes a difference, too. And, you know, for me, it's like when I'm choosing on what to work on, you know, priorities, I want to see the whole child. Absolutely. And that is the most helpful. And that is something where 
maybe you, you can take these training classes, but maybe you need to go find a BCBA or an autism professional to help you figure out what to look for, too. There you go. I, I love that. Uh, somebody had written in on our live feature, I have a five-and-a-half-year-old boy with autism. He's very brilliant and verbal, but extremely hyper. Uh, ha have tried so many things. What should I do? Wow. Lots of levels there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, five-and-a-half-year-old has been diagnosed with autism, brilliant and verbal, but extremely hyper and has tried many things. Um, I would just say, have you looked at any of the studies about the correlation between hyperactivity and pesticides? Uh -oh. Because this, uh, the first one came out in 2011 showing that there was a direct correlation between hyperactive behavior and the level of pesticides in, in kids' urine. And now there have been additional studies to show that. And once you read about what pesticides do, uh -huh it all starts to make sense. I mean, I honestly, before that 2011 study, did not understand pesticide. To me, it was like, well, that kills bugs. So it must be designed to kill bugs. It doesn't kill us. What's this organic issue? Why is it such a big deal, right? But the, the truth is, is that most pesticides don't kill bugs. They are neurotransmitter disruptors is what they are. But that doesn't look good on a jar or on a spray can, right? And what they do is, um, you know, you got a little itty bitty bug, right? So you spray the pesticide on and the, the bug um, gets it in their skin and it disrupts the, the message that goes from their legs to their brain. And first it makes their legs speed up. And so that they're moving so much that they don't concentrate on eating. That's what the, the pesticides do. And if a bug gets a certain amount of it and it speeds up so much that the brain locks up and then they're paralyzed and they can't move so they can't eat. Wow. And that then they starve because they couldn't concentrate enough to eat. So that is what pesticides do. Um, and when you think about children and how sensitive wow. their systems are, and we have more and more children with... ADHD and things of this nature and there have been a lot of people who have gotten their kids as clean as possible and watched them detox off of pesticides and seen that their kids focus better um, and they're finding it in the studies so I, I would ask you to look at that it, it doesn't mean that you have to be um, well, you have to keep yourself from going hysterical about it. There's the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. And, and I would encourage you to look up what that is. The dirty dozen is a list of 12 things every year that the environmental working group tests that says these things, if you buy them commercially um, and don't get them organic, are likely going to have a lot of pesticides on them. And so those become the things you avoid even if you're at a restaurant. The clean 15 are the ones that they recommend. You can buy that conventionally not uh, organically grown and it's not going to have a, pes a pesticide residue enough to have a big impact so that you can figure things out financially because it can be expensive um, but this is a great time of year to go organic and there, and it's a great time in life to go organic because even Walmart is carrying organic things and organic doesn't mean that it's pesticide free that's true you know that's or toxin true. free that's true but at least it will be less yes it will be less and any time there is any kind of physiological manifestation of a behavior in that way like hyperactivity um, there is you can look at it from the autism point of view of being an executive function and not be able to regulate yourself but I always say does the child never stop for anything mm. because if the child never stops for anything something is actually wrong physiologically okay. Um, if they're only stopping for certain things, ah, that's an important <laughs> then point. it's a behavioral ah, point. Okay. And, you know, I've seen all those kids because so many kids, um, previously you couldn't get the diagnosis of ADHD and autism together. Right, right. It was either one or the other. So we would have these kids come in with all these random single diagnoses depending on what doctor they went to. Right. Um, but, but now you can. But now you can. And I've seen the kids in the past. There's not that many that are really ADHD and autism. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like the kids that are truly ADHD are the ones that don't stop for anything. Right. Right. And then the ones that are like choosing can't sit still in school or things they don't like, 
that is where you come from the more behavioral point of view, and that's where ABA comes in. Okay. You know, you go in and you say, like, oh, no, he does stop for certain things that he right. likes, or there's only certain things that he's very interested in, and he will sit for an hour or two playing or, you know, doing whatever it is. Yeah. Then that gives you a clue that this child can do it. Yeah. And maybe that's where the point where you, you know, go the ABA route and, you know, find a BCBA, help you create, you know, do a functional behavior assessment, figure out what the function is, why is he not sitting or standing still or yeah. being able to attend, and then, and then being able to say, oh, it's, you know, it's escape. If I start doing this, suddenly they let me go and I can go do what I want. Yeah. And a lot of times that's what happens in schools oh, because yes. you can't disrupt a class. You yes. know, if I just scream or screech or jump up and down, they're going to move me out of that classroom and, hey, I got away from that boring math lecture. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's, I always say you're going to look at both components yeah. and really see. But, yeah, so many of our kids that do come in and, you know, just are co constant hyperactivity, they are, I always say, find the aut uh, an autism doctor who can look at biomedically and just make sure there's nothing going on yeah. in that way. But yeah. The, Pesticides do have an effect. I actually got told I went to a doctor oh. and I said, "Oh, he had a plum last week," and I started hyperventilating. Oh my And I had to goodness. like do Benadryl. I couldn't. I stopped breathing. Like and I, I think like, it was a pesticide. And he said, "And you ate a plum last week, and you're okay, but this week it's not." He's like, "It's a pesticide on that plum." Wow. He was like, "You're not allergic to plums now. You've been eating them all your life." Wow. But because you had one two weeks ago, but now this week you had this one episode, he's like, "There's a pesticide on that plum." And it was an organic plum. Yeah. It's a little scary. Um, That's very scary. Yeah. And I've actually had that happen to random things now, other foods, and where I can eat one version, but I can't eat the other. Wow. And um, so it shows that I have some science sensitivity. Wow. It. And it was the homeopath that told me that. I had taken my daughter for something else, but it was crazy that he's like, no, you, do, you can't eat one thing one week, and the next week you can't eat it. i got to be honest. I think that, you know, uh, Going to a local farmer's market and on a regular basis and getting to know the farmer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and even when you, I mean, they, everybody wants to encourage us to be local vores where you eat within 100 miles um, because it's better for our, our entire environment. It's better for us. It's better for the bees, so on and so forth. Uh, that isn't possible for everyone, but if you have a farmer's market, this is the time of year. Yes. Go to the farmer's market, ask questions, get to know the farmer. Um, you know, sometimes there there are farmers, uh, we just moved, so I'm, I'm away from my home farmer's market now that we went to for 15 years. Um, there are farmers that I trusted that they were not certified organic, but I trusted them that over the last 10 years they had not used pesticides and that they would tell me exactly what they were using and when they were using and uh, so on and so forth. So I do think it's like get to know your local farmer yeah. kind of time. And I hate it to is. be that way because I used to make fun of people who were that way. Uh, but, you know, when you see your health start to change and hyperventilate, my goodness. That's... No, it was crazy. I stopped being able to breathe. It, oh. I started wheezing right away. And I was like, what is going on? Yeah. And, um, when he told me that, I thought, wow, this is all the things I read about in my autism world. Yeah. And yeah. it's like the first time it actually hit me. Ooh, so. that's scary to me. Uh, okay, so uh, somebody who said, for a child who spent so much time in biomedical and not in conservative therapies, which include ABA, and starts at 12 and has no real express expressive language but does have receptive, what is the prognosis as the brain has matured? So I'm going to cut to the chase on that question because there are a lot of people out there that are watching that, uh, you know, what moms will say uh, to me all the time is they say, I missed the boat. I missed the boat. I didn't know about ABA. My child is now 12. Um, in this case, the child, um, no real expressive language, but does have receptive language. And it's what everybody wants to know. What are, what are my odds? What are my chances? What's the prognosis? How's my child going to do? And you know what? I just say jump on the bandwagon now you know do yeah. your child needs to learn how to communicate we can't tell you what the end result's going to be yeah but do it now um there's a a lot of kids are still learning yes there's so many kids are still learning when when i first started doing ABA, they used to say that you know the window of development was between four and seven yeah. and they thought it closed then it was 
Well, oh no, we realize the brain probably develops till about 13. Mm -hmm. And then now they're, um, for, for males, they're saying adolescence, there's a doctor that says that adolescence doesn't finish for males until 25. Right. Because they realize the prefrontal right. cortex of your brain continues to develop through that age. Yeah. And that's the part that is like impulse control, self-regulation, and all of that. So we know now that your brain continues to develop. Yes. You know, through your 20s. And just do it now. Your child needs to learn how to communicate, be able to express himself. When teen years come and he still is who he is, autism or not, they need yeah. to be able to tell you what they want, what they, you know, what they're interested in, what they're willing to, you know, what they really want to do. And they need to be able to tell you because if they can't tell you, it usually results in some other kind of challenging behavior. Yeah. The, this young person has a right to functional communication. Definitely. And you know, the quickest way that you're going to learn that is through ABA and their life is going to be so much better. The rest of their life are having functional communication, the ability to say in whatever form they can mm -hmm. to be able to say with an iPad or with speech, I have to go to the bathroom. I want sour cream and chives on my baked potato. Step away from me. Don't touch me, right? Or it's too the, loud in here. It's too loud in here. I'm tired. I'm cold. Think of all the things. I, I, you know, we we were challenged a few years ago that one of the people here at CARD said that they'd love to have a day of no vocal speech. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so hard. Right? And and to, to have everybody see what that is like. I honestly don't think that we're capable of doing it. I really don't, which is why I haven't taken it on. I, we talked about doing it on the show. It's very hard to do a show with no, <laughs> right? Um, and, and think about that, about what it's like for these individuals. I'm saying I don't think it's possible, but that is there every day. And the frustration that I would feel if it was 10 minutes, um, and I'd be writing notes, and that's not but fair. But that's communication. Right. Doesn't matter. That's communication, right? Or even pointing. That's communication. Yep. So um, giving this individual functional communication skills is, is going to be the biggest life changer for them right now, and then everything else you get is going to be on top of that. But, um, but, but I love you know just start. Yep, just, just start, start and see where you get. Yep. Just start and say, hey, this is our first focus. He needs to be able to tell us what he wants, what he needs, how he feels. Yeah. And everyone has a right to that. We, we have a wonderful, wonderful viewer who watches the show a lot, uh, Mike Kippel, who is a huge advocate for assistive communication. And he had to wait a while to get his. And he has written about that. And I know, Mike, I can hear you saying, you know, make sure that they know the importance of this. And I always think about Mike um, when I'm talking to a parent who is in the space of, well, I don't know about ABA and starting ABA later. It, honestly, um, do yourself a favor, do this individual the biggest favor of a lifetime to give them the ability to communicate their needs. It's, uh, the, it's just a human right. I mean, I, Definitely. I, I want the UN to adopt that next year as their uh, message for the year. Um, okay, we only have like a minute and a half left, so I, I don't know that we're going to get to anything. But I, I want to thank you for taking the time to answer questions. I want to um, tease a little bit about other shows that we have coming up. On Absolutely. tomorrow's show, we uh, <coughs> it's very exciting. We've got um, Matt Asner and Nava asner Paskowitz are going to... Pas <coughs> Are going to be on the show. We're going to try to do a. We're going to try to do a live feed from the new Ed Asner Family Center. I got to do a tour of it uh, about a week and a half ago. It's just fabulous. They're in the middle of their camp sessions this summer for Camp Ed, and um, so we want to be able to showcase what they're doing over there. And then we have a a wonderful physician who is from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic. Uh, Institute is going to talk about some research that they have going on there, which I think is going to be really fabulous. So that's our big show tomorrow. And then on Friday, Nancy and I are going to be here. We've got this one, the author of this wonderful book, Dr. William Lane. And then we have a wonderful self-advocate who's going to be on talking about something called Boston Calm. Uh, a project that she's involved with to help make sure that individuals on the spectrum have a way of accessing stuff. Um, in Boston. So, but stop being invisible. Dr. William Lane will be talking about that on Friday with Nancy. Until then, 
give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.